Well, for me, it was, um, man, it was about almost 20 years ago that I started to work for a church. They invited me on staff of this church. It was in Las Vegas, Nevada, where most people start working at churches. And, uh, and, and they said, hey, um, let's do this. Let's give you like six months. Like you give six months, you tell us how, how it's going for you. You tell us if this is a fit. We'll at the end of the six months, we'll let you know if we think if you're a fit. And, and if either of us are out, like we can kind of go our own way. And I said, okay, like for me, I knew nothing about what it meant to be a pastor. And so I was watching all the time. I was listening. I was reading. I was going to seminary. But there was this man that I had no idea God was going to bring into my life that I, that I believe really began to shape my mind and my imagination, really my heart, my theology for what it meant to be a pastor. Uh, he was an Irishman. He was 81 years old, and his office was across the hall from mine. And, and we were at a large church, and so what they did is they kind of separated us. I was the pastor of what they called young couples, so 20s and 30s. I was in my 20s back then. I was just a, a few years married, had a full head of—no, I didn't have any hair even then. But, uh, but, but, but I was eager and ready to see what this was about. And, and a few weeks in, um, he comes in to talk to me, and he's like, How, how's it going? And I'm like, oh, it's going well. Like, I come from the corporate world, so when someone asked you how it's going, you, you talked about results. You talked about all the things you had done, like all the things you could be proud of, the things you were thinking of, like forecasting how this was going to go in, in, in the future. And he's like, um, that's great. How are the people that you're pastoring? I was like, oh, they're, they're awesome. I mean, they're getting married. Like, they're getting married. They're, they're having kids. Like, like, there's, I kind of have this, like, in a way, I said, like, this easy job because it, it's, the, it's not yet where they've hit the hard parts of life. He was a pastor of what they called the prime timers, which was a kind way of saying just they're getting a little older, right? And he's like, uh, and so I was like, but how is it for you? And he's like, no, 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 let's, let's talk about you for a second. He's like, sure, my people that I'm pastoring are growing older. And, and death is a conversation we're talking about and retirement and, and struggles with finances and, and things like that. He's like, but um, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're five years old, 50 years old, or 100 years old. He's like, we, we live in a world where there's a battle that rages every day. He's like, I don't care if you're 20, I don't care if you're 70, that battle comes at you. And the intensity of that battle, like the fatigue of that battle, it can wear you down. It can assault you. It can get you off course. And I was like, how do you, how do you get at that? He goes, well, I ask, I ask a simple question. He goes, I've done it for, for 40, 50 years. So what's that question? I'm waiting for it to be like this really profound. He's like, I asked somebody, like, how was your week? And I was like, oh, oh. you know, like, he's like, no, ask them. And they'll always give you an answer. They'll always give you like, oh, it was great or it was okay or whatever. He goes, and then I ask them again and I just watch their shoulders. I go, no, no, how was your week? He goes, and I see them sigh. <sighs> and I see them exhale. He goes, it doesn't matter how old you are. He goes, you can go through the routine things of life, which I bet you this week, most of you. Now, some of you, you, you had one of those weeks where maybe you experienced high highs or low lows. But most of us, we got up in the morning, we had our coffee, we had our breakfast, we did our work thing or whatever we do. We had our relationships and we came home. And it was a fairly unremarkable week in February of 2024. But we can sit back and go, <sighs> like I've been through something. It's not just because you're getting older. It's because the Bible talks about it. Jesus talks about it. He says there's a war that rages. It's a war that we don't see, and so often we don't even think we're playing a part in, but we're a big part of it. He says there's a spiritual war that rages. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Like, and sometimes you're a direct target. In fact, almost all the time, you're a direct target of that. And what we want to do during this series called God of the Cross 
is we want to talk about the practical realities, the way that Jesus, as he goes to the cross, as he hangs there, as he dies for all of mankind, that it's not some disconnected thing for us. It's not just some religious thing that we believe in and trust in and that it doesn't have any ramifications for today. Last week, we talked about how he dies for the wounds, the wounds that we inflict and the wounds that have been inflicted upon us. We talked about how um, the Bible talks about when he was getting ready to go to the cross, that he set his face towards Jerusalem, that nothing could keep him from going to that cross, that he knew that in order for us to be delivered from those wounds, he had to get there. In Luke, it says, when the days grew near for him to be taken up, which literally means put on the cross, crucified, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. If you take the ancient language and really kind of give it a literal translation, it's like he fixed his face like flint, like nothing could deter him. And folks, he had people that tried to deter him. He had insiders, his own disciples, try to talk him out of it, go a different way. Outsiders try to keep him from what he would accomplish, but he was resolute. Because for him, the cross was everything. Sometimes in church, we can just talk about the eternal ramifications, which we will always talk about those in here, because those are massive. The cross allows us life with God eternally, absolutely. But it is not just a ticket to heaven. It is freedom today from the sin that we participate in or that has been, you know, levied at us, the wounds that we have lived in. And today we'll talk about the lies that we have believed. The question that Jesus asks in this, in this amazing passage in John chapter 5, he comes upon a man who can't walk. He asks this question, he says, do you want to be healed? And that's the question I'm going to ask every Sunday of this series. When we talked about wounds last week, we talked about how we have these wounds, but we get so comfortable with them. And Jesus asks us, do we want to be healed? And it, and it takes, man, it, it, it takes some willingness to trust, to submit, and to surrender. And this week, it is all the same because we're going to talk about lies. And if you're like, Kyle, I don't want to live with lies. We say that but we do it. In fact, there are lies that we cling to. They're like these things we think we need in order to survive. If you've ever been in a conversation with someone where they know the right thing to do, but they'll go, but, and then they'll throw it out there. That's a lie that we grip onto. I'll talk about a few of mine that I've, God has revealed for me in my life. In the midst of this spiritual battle, lies, man, they are a potent weapon. In fact, the spiritual battle that we know, it all began with a lie. In the book of Genesis, God creates. And if you haven't read it, Genesis 1 and 2, even if you don't call yourself a Christ follower, if you want to know what, what the God of Christianity looks like, look at one, Genesis 1 and 2. He is this creative God, this God who, who, who speaks and things happen. And we get things like the oceans and Yosemite and the mountains. We get things like flowers and plants and trees. We get things like a man and a woman and them coming together. And what else do we get? We get generosity. He creates this world and he says, here, I'm going to give it to you. And then Genesis 3 happens. It starts with this passage that says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? So the serpent sly, like he doesn't come up to the woman right away and say, Man, God, he's just withholding. Or God, that guy, get a load of him, right? I don't like him. He doesn't say that. He says, Did he really say? Like he's kind of sliding in there. He's kind of starting to plant seeds of doubt. Did he really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And then Eve responds, and here's what she says. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. 
Let, let's put this in proper context, guys. The Garden of Eden is not a small little plot in someone's front yard, okay? It's not like he was like, I'm going to do some square foot gardening, and that's what I'm going to give to them. He creates the world, and he says, it is yours, all of it. Take it, subdue it, like, 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 like organize it, multiply it. But there's one tree, he says, don't eat that, man. It's not a good idea. It's not good for you. Like death will come if you eat from that tree. So I don't want you thinking, man, God is this God who like makes this little thing and then says, don't have that. No, he gives them everything. But he says, this one thing is not, it's not good for you. It continues. No, you will not die, he says. The serpent said to the woman, in fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Begins with this lie. Begins with Satan planting seeds of doubt, seeds of mistrust in God, so much so that they say no. They say, I'm going to go the road of the deception. No, God, even though you created me, even though I come from you, even though you gave me everything, why are you keeping that from me? I'm going to take that. It's a lie that starts this course that we live in today. Where the powers of God's goodness and the evil of Satan's deception war against each other. It's something that every one of us finds us in today. And when it comes to lies, he has not stopped. The Bible says this, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That, that's one sentence. So what I love about it is it's kind of like one of my boys when he was a toddler, he would speak really quickly and his vocabulary could not catch up sometimes with, with, the, with how fast his brain was going. It's a little bit like his dad. And um, he, would, uh, he would come in and he'd be like, mom made these cookies and they're so good, yummy, good. They're good, good, yum, they're good. He'd say it like 12 times. And I love how John does that here. He's like, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar, the father of lies. Like, just in case you missed the first part, I'll give you the second part, and then the third part, and the fourth part. Just so you know, he always lies. That's who he is. And he's not passive. This is where I'm just going to confess naivety. Like in my early years, pastoring, following Jesus. Like, like I thought, I did not take this that seriously. But the Bible does. Peter does. He says, be serious. Be alert. Like open your eyes. The ad, your adversary. He says, this is your adversary. Not your spouse. Not that neighbor. Not that Republican, not that Democrat. Like your adversary is the devil and he is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Like this is what he looks like. This is the seriousness with which he comes at it. So he's looking for you. He, he's waiting to pick you off. You've seen when animals attack, right? Like, if you're that one who starts limping, uh-oh, they change the music always, and here comes the lion, and you know. But this is who he is, and this is what he does. It all began with a lie, and what this tells us is that it's all sustained with a lie. He will not stop lying. He will not stop inviting you to know lies. And he does it the same way that he did in Genesis. The first thing he does is um, he lies to us about our view of God, our view of Yahweh. It's what he did with Adam and Eve. Did God really tell you that? Is that who he really is? He does that all the time today. He's done that all the time always. 
Now, 500 years ago, it, it was different. What do I mean by that? Well, he would plant lies in people that, that God was, um, was so much beyond them that they couldn't be connected to him. That they were so poor, they were so lowly, they were so worthless that, that they couldn't connect with him. And, and he used like lies to, to, um, to infiltrate and make like professional clergy, like support this idea and disconnect God from people. A reformation happens. And then an industrial revolution happens. The enlightenment happens. And all of a sudden, men and women and their collective ego goes from being down here to up here. We created the internet. We created Facebook. God, you now answer to us. Right? Do you know how many times people say to me, like, Kyle, when I get in front of God, do you know what he's going to have to answer for? I'm always like, oh, interesting. <laughs> Anytime I ever read that text, when people get in front of God, they are speechless. They're like freaking out. They're begging him like, please, right? But that, that's just the way Satan works. He doesn't care which side you're on. He just cares that you're not in the truth. If you feel worthless, if you think God's too distant from you, too far from you, Satan's cool with that. If you think you're better than him, if you think he, he answers to you, if you think you get to set his agenda, he's cool with that. Just don't be in the middle. Don't be someone that he loves, that he wants to give grace, that he wants to redeem, that he says he wants you to come and be his child, his son or his daughter, grow up and know who he is and what he's about. Just don't be in the middle. He loves to elevate our worth as people or rob our worth. Just don't put it in the true spot. What else does he do? He lies to us about others. They are always the problem or they are always the person we worship. Often for us, it's they are the problem. Like we have a way to compare ourselves and to gain information in today's world where we can find our enemies, name them, locate them, and they are what's wrong with the world. If I could just get them out, everything would be so much better. And do you know what? Advertisers know this, and so they perpetuate it, and they entice us with it, and they invite us into it. And guys, it is all about Satan, inviting us to know lies, inviting us down a road where we would mistrust God, not understand ourselves, and absolutely look at others as the enemy, as the objective to overcome. We are a church when you walk in where it says hope for everyone. And if you're like me, maybe 20 years ago, when I used to go to church long before I was a Christian, right now you'd be saying, doesn't sound like a lot of hope. But guys, what's amazing is in the book of Genesis, right after Adam and Eve buy into that lie, the first passage of redemption in the Bible is known. God says, I am coming with a plan. I'm going to begin to move. And from a woman is going to come a man, and he is going to put down this deception. He is going to overcome this evil, and it is going to be finished. We know that as Jesus. And as he comes and he is born, he puts on flesh and he starts inviting people to follow him. He starts telling people who God is. He starts to say, this is what it like, looks like to walk in truth. This is what it looks like to fight those lies. One of the first things he does is he, um, he tells us to stay close. He, he calls his disciples and he says what? Follow me. Be with me. He lives life with them. Now, what's crazy about Jesus is most rabbis of the day, their goal was to raise them up, send them out, right? Raise them up like they become amazing, and then they go, they are disciples of you somewhere else. They tell people about you, they graduate from you. The trick is, 
Jesus never wants us to leave him. Does he want us to mature in our faith? Absolutely. But in John 15, he says, like, the actual goal of this is that you would abide in me. And that you would become one with me like I am one with the Father. And we are never separated. Even after he dies, he says, wherever you go, I am with you always. He sends his spirit to dwell within us so we're never separated. You stay close. And it starts to make sense. Jesus calls us, and and if you don't know this, I'm just going to tell you, he calls us sheep. That's not super flattering, okay? Like God, Jesus is our shepherd, He's a, we are sheep, and never, never, I don't think you've ever went like, man, that is a cool looking sheep, you know? Like we talked about when animals attack earlier, like there's never like when sheep attack, yeah? They have to stay close. If they don't stay close to their shepherd, they get devoured. I think of it like my boys, my boys when they were little, anytime we went into some place that was maybe new, Maybe a little threatening, a little scary. One of them would do the belt loop hook. He'd hook his finger around my belt loop. No matter where I went, I was like, oh, yep, you're there, you know? And the other one would grab like my shirt and my pants right here and just hold on tight. We stay close. We let him be the God who protects us from these lies. We don't graduate from Jesus. I'm just going to confess, my mind naturally thinks I should. I think I should learn enough, know enough, be skilled enough, aware enough that someday I can go, Jesus, thank you. I've got this figured out. Watch me work. It's not true. Mature Christian always is clinging to Jesus, always is holding tight to the shepherd always staying close. The lies come. He comes to devour, but the shepherd is there. We stay close, and we expose and we reject the lie. In the book of Ephesians, it talks about taking darkness that is in us, Lies that we've believed, sin that we've participated in. It says, bring it to the light, which is the opposite of what you think you hear in church. At least it's the opposite of what you see modeled in church. Where if you have issues, if you have sin, if you have darkness, it's hide it. Don't tell people about it. Don't talk like you have issues. How was your week? It was amazing. Not how was your week? Oh, it was brutal. Like I'm struggling. But Ephesians says, expose it. Bring it to the light. Reject the lie. In there, God will start to redeem. He'll start to make something new out of that. There's some practical ways that we can do this. One of the things I do in my prayer with God is I just name it. I'll say, God, I I think I'm believing and I'll just speak it out. I'll try to talk about where it comes from. Jesus, the Bible, it talks about um, sin. The lies that we believe often come from the world, like the culture that we're in, our own flesh, or the devil. And so I'll say, God, I I think this is coming from my flesh. Or I think, man, culture is making me think, I I want, I got to be the best pastor. I got to have the biggest church. I got to make the most influence. And I'll just say that, God, I I hate that I want to buy into that lie. I'll speak it. It's a powerful thing to put words to it. But I'll call out where it's coming from. And then I'll reject it. And this is the interesting piece. Because the first two, the first two steps for me seem to be easy, but it's when I put words to saying, God, I know this is a lie and I don't want anything to do with it. Like that's when I reject it. It seems like my tongue gets twisted. My mouth has a hard time speaking it because for some reason it's attractive to me. Have you ever tried that? If you haven't been in church much, I don't know, I'm not trying to use examples that don't make sense, but bear with me here. 
I'm not trying to pick on guys, but I, I want to talk about men's groups and how I think they can often fall into this. It's a big deal for a man to say, I'm going to a group, a small group, a life group. I'm going to trust guys with what's been going on with my life. It's a big deal. Like, it's just not how we're wired. And so men come and they show up, and often once they get talking, they will get comfortable and they will risk. They'll boldly risk. And they'll say something like, man, I just, I can't stop drinking. Or man, I, I just don't like the way I talk to my wife. I mean, I, I'm just going down roads of pornography, and, 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 and I just got to tell you guys that. And it's a big deal when a man confesses, like, and so you'll see guys come around, and they'll pray for them, and they'll, and they'll extend grace to them, and that's, and that's awesome, and then it's beautiful. But, but what I've experienced all of it is that we, we kind of name it, and we expose it, but we don't then reject it. And so then the next week, it happens again. And then the next week, it happens again. And nobody says, hey, man, how are we going to join with you in, in, in helping you step out of this lie? Like walk away from this lie. I always say it's the difference between transparency and vulnerability. Transparency is here are all my issues. You don't get to say anything about them. Vulnerability says, here are all my issues. I need some help. Can you help me? And for me, and maybe it's different for you, but when I say, God, I don't want to believe this lie. I want to be done with this lie. I'm saying to him, help. Dad, help. Please help me take a step out of this. I don't want to live in this anymore. And then tell someone. Like the, the church, guys, I promise you, no matter what church you go to, no matter how long you go to, you will always find beauty, you will always find mess. That's the way God has designed it. And if you ever come to me and you're like, Kyle, I like refuge, but it's messy, I'll be like, yep, because you're here and so am I. <laughs> People are here. But for whatever reason, God has designed his church to be a place where we get to minister to each other. Not because we're qualified, but because his spirit lets us be qualified. And we get to confess and forgive each other. And then join each other in stepping out of those lies. It's about seven years ago. I, um, I, I was given a sabbatical. I'd been pastoring the church that I was, a part, that I was leading for eight years. And the elders came to me and said, um, we want to give you and your family a sabbatical. Like, thank you. Planting a church is hard. Like, we want to give you three months. Go and relax. Go and refresh. Go and be with God. They gave us a, a, a home on the water, the ocean in, in, in Florida. And I was like, what a gift. And my wife and my kids were like, this is amazing. And inside, I was like, what am I going to do? Because my whole life, you guys, if you've been around here, know, like I grew up in a, in a religion, not Christianity, that was based on works. So my whole life, I had been proving my worth by what I did. And they were going to say, I couldn't work for three months. So how was I going to be valuable for those three months? That might seem small to you, but it's a big deal for me. God started to show me the lie that I had believed. And that lie, that lie, especially in a lot of dudes, has crushed marriages, has destroyed relationships with fathers and sons and daughters. That lie that you have to just keep producing and working, and he said to me, it's got to stop. And so I told Joy, Joy is my wife, which that's always the best thing and the worst thing. Because she is someone who's like, all right, how do we give it to him? And I started down a path with a, with a guy's group. I, I started down a path even with talking to the congregation about it. Where I was like, guys, I got, I got a journey out of this. We set up even um, structure around my sabbatical where I couldn't look at my email. 
and, and my wife would have to get, so my assistant would get my email, and then my assistant, if she thought it should go to me, would send it to Joy, and then Joy, if it thought she thought it should go to me, would give it to me. Do you know how many emails I got over those three months? <laughs> Zero. I started to tell people, if I tell you what I did on my sabbatical and it looks like I'm showing off, you should be like, Kyle, I need to pray for you. Just say that to me and I'll get the hint, right? If I start telling you, well, I read this book and this book and I did this and I did that because I thought that's what you had to do to be valuable. Even though I read the scriptures all the time and knew God was a God of Sabbath and God was a God of rest and a God was, our God is a God who does not demand that you produce, produce, produce. My brain, had, my body had believed that lie. Ah. But there is freedom when you begin to trust in the God who delivers us from lies. When you cling tight to him, stay close, expose and reject the lies, and then immerse yourself in his truth. The lies that come at us every day, think about how much time not only we hear them, but we actually put ourselves in places of receiving it. If you're an older generation, you watch TV or read a newspaper. I, I'm a newspaper guy. And I said that in the, in, the, in the volunteer service and their kids are just like, what is this newspaper thing you speak of, right? But you can hear it. If you flip open your phone and you go to social media or you go to your favorite news channel, you go to your favorite cultural commentary, you will see it. We immerse ourselves in lies. Do we immerse ourselves in truth? If we spend a couple hours taking in stuff every day that's meant to deceive us, but we just do 10 minutes in the morning of truth, that's an interesting way to kind of train for our day. And the last, last one is obey the truth you know. So many things as you start to follow Jesus that will become true. But it's still up to us to say, I'm going to believe it and I'm now going to step into it. I'm going to believe it and I'm going to practice it. I'm going to believe it and I'm actually going to put it into play in my life. And it might be funky or messy at first, but I'm going to go down that road. One of the ways we do that every week is we take communion. And people have asked me, why do we do this every week? Well, Jesus said, when you get together, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take the bread and I want you to, to, to break it. And I want you to know this is my body broken for you. And I want you to take the cup and I want you to see it. And I want you to know that that is my blood poured out for you. And what I believe is when we come and we practice this, when we come and we obey what we know is true, we see our God fighting the lies that come at us. If you believe that he's a God who is withholding, man, you can't come to that table and believe that anymore because he gave you the greatest gift, his son. If you believe you cannot know him, you come to that table, no, you sit at the prized place where he serves you and loves you and gives you everything you need. If you believe there's no hope, you come there knowing you have all the hope offered in the broken bread and the cup. Refuge, we are not helpless in the battle that rages every day. When Adam and Eve first believed that first lie, God immediately began to act. And he gave us a savior who hung on a cross. And when he talked about all the sin and the wounds and the lies of the world, said, it is finished. So we can come to this table today, take this bread, take this cup, leave here filled with his spirit, knowing that lies don't stand a chance. Pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you that you do work and act on our behalf. 
that a battle rages, Lord, but you are the conqueror. That death had a minute, Lord, but you rose from the grave. That lies started it, but you ended it. God, you are good. Would we praise you and trust you today? Would we know we can come to you with any of the lies that are coming at us or lies we've even grabbed onto? And no, you don't reject us or shame us, but you, you save us and redeem us. We praise you, Father. We say this in Jesus' name.